Anyway, uh, like I said, today I'm going to talk about, of course, Napoleon, the you know, age of Napoleon that dominates Europe in pretty much the early 1800s. I'll kind of get into uh, how, you know, Napoleon rise to power, uh, seize control of France and Europe. And then, of course, we'll talk about the Napoleonic Wars, which were really one of the bloodiest conflicts that would occur, of course, uh, in modern Europe at the time. So I'll get into that. So if you have any comments, questions, you know, about the lecture, uh, you know, let me know in the live stream, or you can always leave me comments, of course, questions uh, on my channel. So anyway, from last time, I had talked about how, you know, the uh, French Revolution had pretty much overthrown the Bourbon uh, regime. Uh, and of course, France went through a lot of reforms in the country. Uh, and then, of course, what happened was the Jacobins took over, the radicals that like, like Maximilian Robespierre and all that. Uh, and then what's going to happen, of course, under the directory government that kind of comes in at the end of the French Revolution, uh, you're going to see the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, who, of course, was a very famous, uh, not just a general, but you'll see a very famous French statesman uh, as well. So I'm going to talk first a little bit about, of course, the early life of Napoleon. We'll kind of get into you know, the background of Napoleon, like who he was uh, and all that. Uh, Napoleon was born in the 1760s. Uh, 1769 is about when he was born, died in 1821. I think he only lived about 51 years, uh, if you know uh, Napoleon. And um, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, by the way, uh, was not really uh, French. Uh, he, of course, later would become like a Frenchman. But uh, if you know about the origins of Napoleon, he was actually born on the island of Corsica, which is uh, now part of France today. Um, and it's believed that the background of Napoleon uh, is primarily uh, from Italian, Italian descent. Uh, I think I think they say his family, the Bonaparte family, originated from somewhere in the northern part of Italy. Uh, I think likely around Tuscany, I think, where they originate from. And uh, Napoleon uh, is not, like I said later, not just a military genius. He's this modern general. Uh, he's going to be considered one of the first major modern generals of, you know, of this time. He helps to really change warfare in Europe afterwards. Uh, later, he's a statesman, like the head of the French government. And then in 1804, he also reigned uh, as emperor. So he was later known as Emperor Napoleon I. Uh, he later has a nephew that will reign too. Uh, as emperor, which is uh, Napoleon III, as we'll get to later, I think, later in the week. Uh, Napoleon was a pretty good general. Uh, like if you look at his military career, which lasted close to 30 years, uh, Napoleon's win record, like his win-loss record, was almost 90%, like not quite, but almost. And most of his battles he lost were more into the end of his career. Um. Now, I'm going to kind of get into some of the early, you know, uh, life of, of Napoleon. So you can see he was born uh, to kind of an aristocratic family uh, on the island of Corsica. Uh, that's an earlier painting of Napoleon you see on the right there. Uh, he later attended a bunch of schools, of course, in France, uh, northern France, uh, by the 1780s. So kind of, you can kind of see his, his rapid descent through, of course, the French army. A lot of it had to do with, of course, the French Revolution. I think without the French Revolution, uh, Napoleon would not have been, of course, very successful. Uh, Napoleon, by the way, was later had nicknames. I probably heard about this before, but uh, he was later known as nicknames like the Little Corporal, which was more of a terms of endearment that uh, his troops would call him because uh, he was kind of seen as almost like being one of theirs. Uh, like a non-commissioned officer or something like that. And then I think when he became emperor later, they called him the little emperor or petite emperor. Uh, it's kind of a myth that Napoleon was short, by the way. Uh, I, I think he was only average height, five foot six, but obviously wasn't very tall. Uh, that was his parents right there. You see uh, in that picture, uh, his father uh, named Carlo Bonaparte uh, was believed to be like a Corsican lawyer. Uh, and then that's his mother on the right. Uh, Letizia, you know, Letizia, of course, he was very more closer with, uh, I think he kind of saw his father as more of a scoundrel, uh, but he saw his mother as being really the one uh, that was the head of the family. And I think she he once said that she had she had the head of a man, but the heart of a woman. <laughs> That's the kind of the joke uh, he said. But um, 
I think he owed a lot to his mother more than anything, taught him a lot of things about life uh, in general, why he was such a great person later. Uh, that's their family home, by the way, uh, the Jaco uh, Corsica, uh, where he, I guess, grew up uh, when he was young. Uh, but his father later sent him to uh, military schools, of course, uh, in France. Uh, later in his life, of course, when he was a teenager, he would attend that famous school you're looking at, which is the Ecole Militaire, uh, which was the uh, at the time the Bourbon's main military academy where they pretty much uh, you know, groomed uh, officers for uh, the French military. Uh, it's kind of like today, still kind of considered like the, the, the French is like West Point uh, for their military. So it kind of be kind of comparable uh, to that. Uh, and it's believed that Napoleon uh, graduated from that academy uh, at the age of 16 uh, with the French artillery. So he started with, he was only a second lieutenant. Uh, so he kind of started on the bottom uh, as an officer uh, overall. So considered one of the greatest military careers, by the way, uh, in history, uh, it would only take Napoleon about eight years, by the way, uh, to go from uh, second lieutenant uh, all the way to uh, like a brigadier general. It was in just eight year period. But a lot of it was because of the combination of the you know, French Revolution and the French Revolutionary Wars that were kind of going on uh, at the time. Uh, of course, talk a little bit about the military career of Napoleon. Uh, a lot of it was uh, owed to different, uh, I guess, military events that happened during the French Revolutionary Wars. Uh, Napoleon just happened to be at the right place uh, at the right time uh, that kind of helped him to, you know, move up in the French military uh, one of his first great successes uh, was the Siege of Toulon, which happened uh, in November, December of 1793. Uh, that was when the British had come into the French port of Toulon on the Mediterranean Sea and laid siege to it with their, with their fleet. Uh, and uh, Napoleon, who was a captain at the time in the French military, the artillery, uh, came up with an ingenious plan, uh, which was to storm the heights of Toulon and then fire cannon uh, at the British ships that were in the harbor. Uh, and so he was basically able to drive the, the British fleet out uh, at that point. And so because of that, he was promoted afterwards to Brigadier General. Uh, so that's how he, he got promoted to becoming a general. And so Napoleon just, kind of, I guess, happened to be at the right time. You know, and I think at first they would listen to what he wanted to do militarily, but they realized that he had some kind of knowledge. Uh, then, of course, the other thing that they talk about sometimes that, you know, also helped his career as well, there was a deal where in 1795 in the fall, uh, the Constitutional Convention was meeting for what would be the directory government that was forming at that at that point, uh, at the end of the French Revolution. And uh, there was a case where mobs of um, pro-royalists were attempting to storm it, uh, to maybe put put the monarch back in power. Uh, and so uh, apparently he was the only general in town uh, in Paris. And so they, they got him out. And of course, Napoleon was, like I said, expert with artillery. Uh, and so he used like basically uh, artillery on the mobs uh, to quell, I guess, this possible revolt. I think it was Thomas Carlyle in his famous book, uh, The French Revolution of History, which probably was one of the first historical works written on the French Revolution at the time. Uh, said the famous comment about this that Napoleon used a whip of grape shot, basically to uh, do this, and that that led after that Napoleon becoming full general uh, after that. So uh, then, of course, uh, if you know about this, Napoleon also met uh, what is um, Josephine. If you know about her, uh, her real name is uh, Josephine de Beauharnais. Um, well, actually, she was called Rose, but Napoleon called her Josephine. And uh, she was the former mistress of Paul Barat, one of the directors, you know, in the directory government that was running. And so that was kind of important about that. A um, little bit about her. Josephine uh, was a French Creole. She had been born in the Caribbean uh, on the island of Martinique. Uh, her husband had died on the guillotine. Uh, so she was a widow. Uh, and so, but she had a lot of influence in the actual French government. So they think that, 
that's part of why Napoleon was able to rise to power uh, because of her influence. Uh, and um, I think she married him because uh, she needed like someone to support her uh, financially or whatever. Uh, and she was actually a few years older than him, uh, which is true about that. And I think there's a debate about if she really liked him or not, you know, because if you know about it, Josephine cheated on Napoleon several times. Uh, and um, but Napoleon had many, many, you know, mistresses. I think I forget how many he had girlfriends, mistresses, but it was, I think, over 30 or something at one point. <laughs> um, later, he had a second wife. And she will, by the way, she'll be later his first empress consort. Uh, 1804 uh, to 1810. Uh, Napoleon later does have a second wife he marries, uh, which is Marie Louise, uh, who is the Duchess of Parma. Uh, she was the daughter of the Emperor of Austria, uh, which was France II. He was Holy Roman Emperor as well. And uh, he'll be later his father-in-law. It's kind of a tragic story about that, but later in the Napoleonic Wars, they end up you know, fighting each other uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, but she was the only one that gave Napoleon a legitimate son, which was Napoleon II, uh, uh, he was called. And uh, but Napoleon called Napoleon II the little eaglet, the little eagle. Uh, and um, I think he died young, if you know about that, Napoleon II, which was 21. He was later called Emperor Napoleon II, but he never really reigned. All right, let me talk about what happened next. Now, uh, what happened, uh, of course, at this point was that Napoleon was then given, given command of a, of a new army uh, to basically fight uh, in the French Revolutionary Wars, uh, which I think Paul Barat uh, was behind there on that picture on the right. Uh, and uh, he was commanded this army that was called the Army of Italy uh, from 1796 uh, to 97. And he used this army to cross the Alps uh, into northern Italy and fight against Austria primarily. And there's also this other state called Sardinia, the kingdom of Sardinia or Piedmont Sardinia, uh, which was in the northwestern part of Italy in the Alps. And uh, this was all part of the uh, so-called First Coalition that was fighting France at the time and the French Revolutionary Wars, uh, Britain, Austria, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, Prussia, uh, Sardinia, the Dutch, uh, all these different countries were arrayed uh, against France, the French Republic, uh, at the time. And uh, Napoleon was actually very successful in this Italian campaign, which mostly happened in 1796, uh, where he fought them up in the Alps. Uh, and uh, in several battles, Napoleon just clobbered uh, the coalition side, uh, defeating, I think, first the Sardinian, P Piedmont Sardinian side. Uh, and then uh, he drove the Austrians back into Austria, drove them out of Italy, uh, pretty much. And um, the Austrians had never seen a general like Napoleon. He was just this modernized general that uh, fought new kinds of tactics that they, they'd never seen before. He, he wouldn't just attack them in the middle. He would attack their flanks. He would try to attack them in the rear. Uh, Napoleon just kept coming at them. Uh, he would attack any kind of conditions. If it was raining, snowing, whatever, nighttime, uh, he would attack them. Uh, I think usually in the old days, if you've got an army in check, they would just let the general back off, but not in this case. He would go after him uh, instead. Um, there is a battle called the Battle of Lodi you see there, May 10th, 1796. Uh, it's after that battle that Napoleon really starts to become a legend, uh, and a lot of his troops start calling him the, the Little Corporal. And so 1796, I want to say after about 1812, 1813, Napoleon's almost unbeatable. On the battle, he, very, he loses very few battles, uh, you know, a period of like 15 years. Uh, they, there was a treaty, of course, I'll go into a little bit. They had this thing called the Treaty of Campo Formio, of course, October 1797, with, that ended the first coalition war, which eventually Britain will kind of be the only power fighting of uh, that. Uh, and so that's going to force. Um, Napoleon to eventually, like with the French, create new tactics to try to, to knock the British out of the war. I'll get to Italy later, but there'll be a kingdom of Italy that'll kind of emerge in northern Italy because Austria's not there anymore. That won't be until a little later when that happens. Uh, Napoleon had this idea uh, with the French uh, to um, invade Egypt, which um, if you know about this, the British traded a lot 
with India and the Ottoman Empire in the east. Uh, and so um, they wanted to try to destroy a lot of their trade routes that went from, you know, pretty much uh, Europe to the Middle East to India. And so this was all part of another conflict they called that was part of the French Revolutionary Wars. That was the so-called War of the Second Coalition. Uh, that began like in the summer, they think, of 1798. And so about 40,000 troops, uh, Napoleon landed forces uh, in, in what is um, Egypt. I'll get to Horatio Nelson. He's kind of pivotal in that campaign as well uh, on the British side. Oh, that's there. Uh, Napoleon has about 40,000 troops that they bring with the French Navy, uh, which they land in the delta uh, of basically where the Nile is in Egypt, modern Egypt today. And uh, in Egypt at the time, Egypt was defended by these forces that were called Mamluks, which were mercenaries of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, they were really... They couldn't match, you know, Napoleon's forces. And um, on July July 21st, 1798, uh, Napoleon's forces just crushed their, their armies uh, at the Battle of Pyramids. Yeah, July, July 21st, 1798, which took place near Cairo. Uh, and then from there, Napoleon was able to then march on basically was Cairo had taken. And so he would occupy Egypt and later part of Syria uh, from 1798. Uh, to 99. Uh, however, if you know what happened, uh, Napoleon's forces, though, was was his navy was badly defeated uh, when he was in, like, uh, I think, part of the Delta. And uh, in August, I think August 1st to August 3rd, uh, Horatio Nelson, who had been trying to search for basically the, the French's naval force of uh, sailed into uh, the delta of the Nile Basin and uh, trapped his forces and sank or destroyed most of the fleet, like something like about 13 ships or so uh, were either captured or destroyed uh, by uh, the British. Uh, and uh, it was either called the Battle of the Nile, which is what the British called it, or I think the French called it the Battle of Abercrombie Bay, uh, which is in the Nile Delta. Uh, and um, Nelson Nelson became a big hero, of course, uh, after that. Uh, Horatio Nelson, you go back up here, uh, of course, was a big, big figure, you know, in the, the, the naval aspect of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, he would later be known as Lord Nelson, and of course, or Admiral Nelson uh, as well. He would later, later be pivotal also in the Battle of Trafalgar uh, in 18, 1805 uh, as well. So, yeah, that was the only thing about that. Uh, with this, of course, fleet uh, being, you know, trapped, pretty much his whole army's trapped in uh, France uh, after that uh, because of this. Uh, Napoleon does have this deal where, if you know about it, he did he did actually go uh, up into, um, like if you kind of study about uh, Napoleon's forces, uh, he does actually invade Syria. You know, he had this idea, uh, they think, to, maybe conquer Palestine uh, and maybe uh, emancipate the Jews in Europe and, you know, allow them to live there as a homeland. That was kind of an idea he had. Uh, this would also help to hurt the British trade routes also in that region. But that actually failed later. His armies were unable to uh, take like the city of Accra, um, which I think was in northern Israel time today. And then his troops were riddled with bubonic plague as well, which was, of course, another problem, of course, as well. Uh, of course, the most famous thing they always talk about uh, with Napoleon uh, in Egypt, uh, his troops discovered uh, what later became known as the Rosetta Stone, which was found by this uh, French soldier named Pierre-Francois Bouchard, who found it in like this fork uh, in the Delta part of the Nile Basin, uh, a little town called Rosetta, was found actually within a uh, fort called Fort Julian. And he pulled it out, and it was like a half-ton stone uh, that had an inscription on it from the time of the Ptolemaic dynasty uh, in ancient Egypt. And so with that, within a few years, within like I think a, two decades or so, uh, eventually the, the, the French were able to, one of the first to translate uh, the Rosetta Stone, 
uh, a man named um, Jean-Francois Champollion, which you see in that picture there. And Champollion was the one uh, that would translate it first, I think around 1822. Uh, and that would be very important later because uh, they think that the early discoveries of Napoleon uh, in Egypt, they think spawned the whole study of Egyptology uh, later, like real big interest in uh, the study of ancient Egypt, uh, et cetera. And so some people think Napoleon helped to start that afterwards because he brought like all kinds of people with him, artists, scientists, engineers uh, to study ancient Egypt. And they even wrote a kind of a study that they kind of published later that was called the Description of Egypt. Uh, and Napoleon really thought that there were secrets about Egypt that they could learn. Uh, I think he once remarked to his soldiers that soldiers, uh, 40 centuries look down upon you. I think he was talking about this famous Sphinx and all that. Uh, that's in Egypt with the pyramids. And they began studying like the pyramids and, and all that. So that's one thing that Napoleon is kind of famous for, of course, with that. Now, um, what happens, of course, later, uh, Napoleon eventually returns to France in 1799. And uh, as you saw, of course, uh, in that little short video, uh, with a military, he's using the military uh, pretty much, uh, Napoleon would eventually overthrow uh, the French directory government, uh, the so-called coup of 18 Brumaire, because remember, they're still using that old French revolutionary calendar uh, at the time, which I think the actual official day is November 9th, 1799 is when it's at. Uh, and so he uses people that are actually in the government to overthrow uh, the Got a coup, coup within a coup, like I said, uh, to overthrow the government. At first, they were, it was going to be like a government of shared power with several politicians, but Napoleon then basically takes over the government and it becomes more like a dictatorship. And so they really think that when Napoleon seizes power uh, in 1799, that that really signals like the end of the French Revolution uh, at that point. And um, Napoleon once remarked that I am the revolution. That's what he said. And so they think it continues, but more or less uh, he says, yeah, I, I'm the one that's that, the revolution itself now. All right. Um, now you can see there uh, when he takes power under this government, it's later known as the French consulate. That's the actual official nickname. Uh, they actually call the Republican government. Uh, that Napoleon rules with. Uh, he rules as different titles. Uh, his main title was First Consul of France, uh, which at first uh, he was elected uh, to, I believe, uh, a period of like 10 years, uh, which was in uh, 1799, which was through a plebiscite uh, with the French people. Uh, but in 1802, uh, it became uh, Council for Life, uh, is what it is. Which these were all done through elections through plebiscites, science of course and then of course two years later of course what happened uh the french people elected to make him emperor of france uh in 1804 uh and so that's that's going to eventually lead into of course him seizing power and becoming basically a monarch you know emperor emperor Napoleon the first which we'll we'll talk about later but uh before i get into that uh, i did want to talk about the fact that napoleon was known for making reforms to the country uh, he wasn't just, you know, this general that was later an emperor of France. Uh, he was known as a statesman that really tried to reform the country uh, based on the Enlightenment, uh, the uh, revolution, and things like that. And um, probably his biggest legacy in France today that's still around, and it's even Louisiana today, of course, our state, that's the Napoleonic Code, or the Code Napoleon, uh, as they called it. Uh, the official name is actually the Civil Code of 1804, uh, which a bunch of jurists drew up uh, before that. So I think they started working on it right after he took power. And uh, the Napoleonic Code it was a, is a French civil law code system uh, that was developed uh, under Napoleon, uh, signed by him into law uh, in 1804. And uh, a lot of it was based on this ideas of the Enlightenment, like I said, in the ideals of the French Revolution. But it was heavily influenced by the Justinian Code that went back to the Byzantine Empire, Eastern Roman Empire, going back to Emperor Justinian uh, back in the 6th sixth, sixth century. 
And uh, this code uh, influenced a lot of European law code systems throughout Europe. Uh, it really did. Uh, and um, in Louisiana, as you know, this state is very unique because our, our law code systems are heavily influenced uh, by the Napoleonic Code uh, compared to most, you know, about most states in the United States. Uh, they're based on English common law and things like that. Uh, but ours is more based on the Napoleonic Code and even some Spanish influences uh, also as well. That's why when you take the bar exam uh, in Louisiana, it's more difficult uh, because of the Napoleonic Code. Uh, Napoleon also enacted education reform. So he, he, he founded schools called later Lycees, uh, which were originally for boys, uh, for like secondary schools, which would be like mostly middle school, high school type schools, basically. And later it was also for girls added uh, as well. So that's something he did too, uh, trying to reform education and make it more compulsory on uh, things like that uh, in the country. I did create a national bank, which is true, like around 1800. I think the Swiss kind of helped set it up uh, basically in, in France. Uh, but the bank, bank, the bank de France, or bank, yeah, bank de France, they call it now, I guess, French, uh, still is still around. Uh, that corporation uh, today uh, still exists. It's been around for over 200 something years, uh, the Bank Bank of France. Uh, that help was that was important. That helped to stabilize their currency, you know, in a lot of inflation in the country, uh, you know, things like that overall. Uh, and then he restored the Catholic Church. That's one thing that's very famous as well uh, with the Concordat of 1801. Uh, which he made uh, with the Pope at the time, uh, which was Pope Pius VII. Uh, and <clears throat> this particular agreement uh, made that, you know, the Catholicism the main religion of France again, but in France, anyone could practice any religion. So people had freedom of religion. Uh, and if you know about Napoleon, he was uh, pretty much one of the first major rulers of Europe to start emancipating like Jews and other, other kinds of people. I think he didn't have too many negative things to even say about Islam, believe it or not, uh, Napoleon. So, uh, oh, also another thing that Napoleon did, which I think indirectly he did, uh, if you know about this, the French had developed the metric system, if you know about that, uh, in Europe. And uh, that that system later spread throughout Europe, which a lot was due to, like, French conquests and you know, during the Napoleonic Wars and all that. And that'll become more important as a measurement system more than the British measurement system, the imperial system that they have, you know, today uh, overall. And so basically, you know, the meter, the gram, you know, the leader, things like that become, you know, the basic uh, measurements that you have uh, in Europe instead of the inch, foot, ounce, pound, or things like that. So overall. Oh, and there's one more thing I do admit that's still around today that Napoleon also created which the Legion of Honor, uh, which he founded uh, as well. And uh, <clears throat> this was a type of merit system that he created to honor like citizens of France that did good for the country, uh, soldiers that were brave in battle and things like that. And it was a system that was created to kind of uh, get rid of like, you know, noble titles and things like that. Uh, and it had like five ranks to it, by the way, which the highest rank was the Grand Master uh, which the president of France holds today. And you were given rewards like money uh, for achieving a certain rank. And then also medals, which uh, president of France usually is the one that has the Grand Cross, uh, which is the highest medal that you could, of course, achieve. Uh, now, Napoleon, as you know, is eventually you know, coronated as emperor of France. Uh, happened on December 2nd, uh, 1804. Uh, of course, very famously happened in Notre Dame, a uh, famous cathedral in Paris that you know, burned in 2019. Most kings weren't crowned there, by the way. They're crowned at that other, I think it's, there's another Notre Dame theater uh, that's also a cathedral that's in the eastern part of France. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, I think that ceremony was kind of controversial, uh, if you know about it. Uh, in the ceremony, um, the Pope was there to like anoint, you know, uh, Napoleon and uh, crown him. And in the middle of the ceremony, he took the crown from the Pope's hands and he put it on his head. Uh, and then he put the crown on his wife's uh, head, of course, to make her empress consort, but was actually planned <laughs> to do it. But I think Napoleon made this remark once uh, that he said that I found the crown of France in the gutter 
I picked up my sword and I put it on my head. <laughs> That's the famous uh, quote or something like that. So, so anyway, um, but yeah, Josephine is also, like I said, she's crowned as his empress and she'll be uh, his empress consort until uh, 18, I think 1810. Well, it is. So there's Napoleon. Of course, on the right, you see Napoleon kind of dressed as like he's like a Caesar or emperor, of course. Uh, here's, of course, him on the left, more dressed as a, as a like a general. You can see the Grand Cross. You see on the left side of his chest there, uh, like close to his left arm, uh, you can see the Grand Cross, which is that medal that uh, the Grand Master would receive. Now the president of France. Now, the only thing about Napoleon was that Napoleon, when he got crowned emperor, uh, it spawned a bunch of these wars uh, that they now call the Napoleonic Wars, which really start as far back as 1803, uh, they think, go up to like 1814, 1850. And these wars, by the way, were the series of bloody conflicts, which were considered some of the bloodiest conflicts of really the 19th century uh, that you have. Uh, it's because of the fact that they think that close to 3 million soldiers or more may have died uh, fighting throughout Europe, uh, you know, against Napoleon or, or for Napoleon uh, also as well. And so I think there's not too many other conflicts that are as bloody. I think you got the Crimean War that was fought kind of in the 1850s. Yeah, the American Civil War was pretty bloody in the United States in the 1860s. Uh, I think maybe the Franco-Prussian War was another war that was kind of bloody uh, as well. But they don't really stack up, you know, as violent, you know, as this one was, of course. And it took place over a long period of time uh, overall, because like a lot of those other wars were kind of short uh, compared uh, to these wars. <clears throat> uh, part of why the wars were fought uh, was because uh, Europe, uh, there was a bunch of coalitions that were arrayed against Napoleon. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, Sweden, Spain and a few others at one point, Portugal uh, opposed the French Empire. And I always got to the point where everybody uh, was opposing uh, his empire. It's kind of, kind of like what happened with Hitler. Hitler was ganged up by a bunch of allies against, against him. And he had some alliances, but they were kind of weak uh, with him. And uh, But Britain was the major power that really kept the Napoleonic Wars going. Uh, they're the ones that pretty much put up most of the money, of course, to fight uh, against against Napoleon uh, overall. Uh, here's kind of um, kind of a map showing you, by the way, on the left there. You can see all the territories at one point that Napoleon either uh, took over uh, or states that were under Napoleon's control. Uh, so good chunk of Europe from like Spain, Portugal, France through Germany, all the way to Poland at one point were under his control. And also Italy, Kingdom of Italy at one point formed uh, during that, that time period uh, as well. And um, part of why Napoleon was unbeatable uh, during that period was Napoleon uh, devised this army that was called La Grande Armée, uh, which, of course, stood for uh, the Great Army, uh, of which Napoleon liked to call a lot of things great. Like uh, his empire, the Napoleonic Empire, <clears throat> was... Uh, usually they call it the first French Empire, usually, traditionally, uh, but he called it the uh, Grand Empire or Great Empire of Napoleon. <clears throat> so that's what he preferred to call his empire. But this army uh, peaked at close to about 800,000 troops uh, overall. It was considered, by the way, one of the greatest armies uh, at the time, like in modern times. Uh, it was unbeatable <clears throat> for many years. <clears throat> anyway, um, and uh, yeah, um, part of why Napoleon was able to, uh, you know, uh, conquer so much territory and uh, be so successful militarily was because in 1803, um, if you know about this, uh, the French had uh, the French had already had obtained uh, Louisiana from the Spanish in 1800. Uh, and so uh, Napoleon had this idea to conquer the, the New World uh, also as well. But what happened was they had this thing called the Haitian Revolution that broke out in Haiti, uh, in the Caribbean. He lost Haiti 
Uh, and so he decided to sell Louisiana. He didn't want to give it to the British uh, who were in Canada. And so he sold it to the United States, you know, about this so-called Louisiana Purchase, 1803. And uh, he sold it for $15 million. And that money is going to be pretty important, by the way, uh, because uh, he'll use it uh, to develop the Grand Army uh, to fight the coalitions in Europe uh, overall. Uh, by the way, the United States acquired uh, the total area Louisiana purchased for those 828,000 square miles, uh, or if you want acres, uh, it's 530 million acres. That's a lot of land, which I think at the time was around maybe two or three cents an acre, uh, which I think in modern times it was, I think, equivalent to like 40 to 50 cents now. But pretty, pretty good land purchase uh, that we made with that. And it, as you know, doubled the United States, uh, the size of it, of course, afterwards. Uh, now, Napoleon, of course, uh, had this idea, uh, of course, which was to try to defeat the British, to knock them out of the war. Uh, of course, I'm going to get to the, the Battle of Austerlitz uh, in a second uh, with that. Uh, but um, uh, there's going to be a bunch of these conflicts that are going to break out. There's two of them. They have the Wars of the Third. The War of the Third Coalition was the first, I think, war that really Napoleonic Wars that break out uh, in 1805-06. Uh, and then you also had the Fourth Coalition in 1807 uh, that was also uh, as well. Uh, however, <clears throat> if you study about it, Napoleon had this idea uh, to try and defeat Britain first. I think it was even his plan where he marched his Grand Army uh, to the northern part of France, and he was going to try to somehow cross the English Channel uh, to take England. <clears throat> and uh, he had different ideas. Like he, I think he had this idea to deal, build a tunnel uh, under the English Channel. Uh, I think he also was going to have this idea to use hot air balloons where they were going to kind of sail over, you know, the English Channel and try to land there and, <laughs> and conquer it. Neither of those really panned out. Uh, and so his other option was to combine the French and the Spanish. Well, I think Spain was kind of still, you know, supportive of France at that point, 1805, uh, you know, the Bourbons. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> anyway... They combined their naval forces and they were going to try to take control of the English Channel and then maybe take England uh, after that. Uh, however, uh, what happened was the um, British Navy under Lord Nelson uh, attacked, attacked their fleet uh, off of what is called Cape Trafalgar, uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, of course. And uh, they defeated actually a much larger naval force than theirs. Uh, and uh, Nelson was killed the battle, but uh, it was deemed, considered to be one of the greatest naval victories of the whole war uh, for the coalition side uh, in, in the Napoleonic Wars. And so Napoleon really never actually, you know, was able to, to invade Britain. And so that was kind of one of the things that really was a thorn in his side, not being able to build, to defeat the British. Same thing with Hitler, too, you know, in World War II. Uh, as well. <clears throat> uh, well, Napoleon, one of the things he's going to do next, he's going to, he's not able to defeat the, 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 you know, the British at that point. And so he instead invades uh, Austria uh, to, to the east uh, in Germany. And that begins the so-called Ulm campaign, which happened in the fall winter of 1805. And, uh, Quickly, in a matter of like something like three weeks, uh, between September, October, 1805, Napoleon's force just routes the Austrian forces with his, with his Grand Army, uh, and he actually takes the capital of Vienna uh, by November, November 1805, at that point. And so, uh, one of the things that happens is the Russians come in uh, under Alexander the First, uh, Emperor of Russia, and uh, they decide to, you know, combine their forces to try and see if they could defeat Napoleon uh, at this point. And so they're able to muster like something like 90 some thousand troops uh, at what would be the Battle of Austerlitz, which happened on December 2nd, 1805. Uh, Austerlitz was fought in now what is called the Czech Republic. And um, <clears throat> this battle had a nickname. It was later dubbed the Battle of the Three Emperors because of the fact that you had three emperors 
president of the battle, <clears throat> Napoleon, who was, of course, Emperor of France. Uh, but you also had the uh, Emperor of Austria uh, and Holy Roman Emperor uh, France II. Uh, and then also Tsar Alexander I, or Emperor Alexander I, uh, who was the ruler of Russia. So that's that's basically why you know, it was referred to as being called the Battle of the Three Emperors. And this battle is very important. Uh, the Battle of Auschwitz is considered to be really Napoleon's greatest military victory. And uh, even though outnumbered uh, in the battle, uh, Napoleon's forces inflicts heavy casualties uh, on, on the Russian-Austrian forces. You get like routed, basically, like two-thirds of your forces was either uh, captured or killed or wounded uh, in the battle. And um, Russian-Austrian forces suffered like something like 36,000 casualties uh, in the battle, almost half their army, uh, not quite. Uh, and then the, the French only had 8,000 casualties. It was, it was such a rout for uh, Austerlitz. And Austerlitz is a battle which was kind of this kind of con famous battle that's really compared with battles in like ancient history, like Gog of Mel, I think is one you may have heard of, or the Battle of Cannae, uh, which Cannibal was famous for. <clears throat> uh, later, Napoleon would commission the Arc de Triomphe uh, in Paris of uh, being built uh, which would later be built to honor a lot of the soldiers that fought and died, uh, not only in the French Revolutionary Wars, but in the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, later they also added a tomb of the unknown soldier, uh, which was put there, uh, who died in World War I. Uh, and so that's a very famous landmark today, of course, uh, in Paris. But I don't think it was completed later until, I want to say, the 1830s. Uh, but it was basically an idea that he put there originally, like a victory arch, celebrating battles like Austerlitz. <clears throat> All right, yeah, um, so uh, anyway, um, I'm going to, of course, move on to talk about, of course, other battles later. Now, they do have uh, different things that happen afterwards because of that. Uh, because of the fact that Austria uh, gets defeated uh, in 1805, uh, that leads to the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire uh, by 1806, and so Afterwards, France II becomes Emperor of Austria, I think is his official title uh, that he goes by later. And Napoleon creates this buffer state that kind of replaces uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which will be called the Confederation of the Rhine uh, through this treaty called the Treaty of Pressburg, uh, which was signed, I think, by 18, I want to say 06. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> what it does, it creates a buffer state between Prussia uh, in Austrian Empire in, in Central Europe uh, and France uh, in the West. And then also Napoleon takes over Italy. He'll, he'll, he'll form a kingdom there called the Kingdom of Italy uh, as well. Uh, now, Prussia kind of is concerned about this. They decide to declare war uh, on France, which was actually a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, so then Napoleon just marched his Grand Army northward uh, towards Berlin. And so I think I think it's in October of 1806, uh, Napoleon's forces basically routes uh, the Prussian forces under uh, Frederick William III <clears throat> at two battles, one called Jena, another battle called Arstadt. <clears throat> and uh, after that, Napoleon then takes, takes her capital <clears throat> as well. And uh, <clears throat> that's kind of bad for them. Prussia is going to get knocked out of the war uh, at that point, and they won't fight in the war again until 1813. So Prussia, Prussia getting involved in the war is probably not a good idea at that point. And a lot of their, a lot of their soldiers will be, will be forced to be enlisted uh, into a lot of Napoleon's armies uh, that fight in Europe afterwards. Uh, now there's Russia left, of course, in Europe at that point uh, to fight Napoleon. So Napoleon pushes eastward. Uh, to fight against Alexander's forces, like in part of East Prussia and Poland. And uh, they fight one pivotal battle, which I think now is where Kaliningrad is uh, in northern central Europe, uh, which is the Battle of Friedland, which happened on June 14, uh, 1807. Uh, and um, Alexander's forces are routed in that battle, like losing over 40% of his forces. Uh, and so... 
it's at that point that Alexander realized that he has to basically capitulate, of course, uh, with Napoleon. And so that ended pretty much most of the conflicts at that point between those different coalitions. The third and the fourth coalition wars pretty much came to an end. Now, they do sign a treaty between them, uh, which is true, uh, which was called the Peace of Tilsit. Uh, it was signed uh, in July of 1807. Uh, I think one was signed uh, in the middle of a river called the River Neiman, uh, in the middle of a raft where uh, actually uh, Alexander I and uh, Napoleon met uh, to hammer out agreements between them. And then he also met with uh, Frederick William III, like the king, the king of, uh, of Prussia as well. Uh, and what it did was uh, it it forced the Russians to align uh, with France, to become an ally against the British uh, at this point. It also allowed the Russians to kind of free them up in the east uh, if they want to fight, I think, the Ottoman Empire or something like that. But it kind of created their, their, their spheres of influence where Napoleon would control Central Europe uh, in France uh, and then Russia would control the east, <clears throat> basically. Oh, another thing that's famous about uh, the Peace of Tilsit uh, was it also uh, created these buffer states uh, that were there. I didn't want to talk about. Kingdom Westphalia was created uh, in Western Germany, uh, which he put his brother on the throne of it, uh, which was uh, Jerome. Jerome Bonaparte was put in power there. Uh, the Duchy of Warsaw was created, uh, which was this idea of a uh, Polish state uh, that Napoleon believed needed to be in Europe. Uh, and so he created that. And then he also created the so-called free city of Danzig, uh, which is now part of northern Poland today. So that's one thing about Napoleon. He created all these different states uh, throughout Europe and he even put a lot of his relatives on thrones. Uh, like he had another brother named, uh, I think, Joseph, that he put on the throne of Spain at one point, which was kind of controversial uh, as well. Now, the only thing about Napoleon was that his empire didn't last long. Uh, if you know about it, it collapsed within basically a few years uh, after he pretty much formed it or controlled parts of Europe, which is kind of comparable to Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich, Nazi Germany, uh, which would collapse pretty good uh, after its conquest during World War II. And uh, I want to kind of go into uh, and discuss some of the major causes of why uh, his empire collapsed. One of them is the failure of the continental system. This was an economic plan that he kind of came up with to weaken the British uh, and knock them out of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it was kind of this idea uh, to put to put embargoes or blockades on British trade. Uh, and so uh, the idea was to destroy Britain economically, uh, destroy their trade. It's kind of like what they're trying to do with Russia now with that, you know, Russian-Ukraine conflict uh, going on. Uh, and so um, it's kind of comparable with that, but you'll see later it doesn't work. It fails uh, because of the fact that people want free trade. Throughout Europe, you got countries that want to trade with the British, uh, which is kind of a problem. And then also the fact that the British Navy was also considered the big power, you know, ocean-wide throughout the world. And so the French weren't really able to break the, the British Navy, which was a big thing, you know, that really was a thorn in Napoleon's side. You know, not able to, you know, you know, defeat defeat Britain and Europe uh, because of that. Uh, it is true that the um, you study about American history in general, uh, it did cause the so-called War of 1812 uh, to occur uh, which happened between 1812 and 1815. And that was a, that was a conflict that occurred uh, between the United States and, and Great Britain, uh, which had to do with the fact that the United States was trying to trade with Britain and France, where the Napoleonic Wars were, were kind of going on. And so the British started uh, seizing our, our American ships uh, on the high seas, like especially in the Atlantic, uh, and so uh, they even started to impress American sailors into uh, the Royal Navy uh, to, to fight Napoleon. 
And so this this forced us to kind of get into a war with them. And so we declared war on them in 1812. And I think we even tried to invade Canada at that point, if you know about which failed. And the British would invade the United States and attack Washington, D.C. And you see on the right there, one point, uh, their troops actually burned down the White House, the original White House uh, that was not there anymore. The, the new second White House now there now, but they burned that. And I think they also bound, burned the uh, Capitol building uh, as well. Uh, but later, uh, if you know about in 1815, uh, the British tried to invade New Orleans to seize Louisiana from the United States and Andrew Jackson defeated them at the Battle of New Orleans, uh, of course, January 8th, uh, 1815. So yeah, we did get revenge on them later, but it is amazing how you know the British were able to fight the United States and Napoleon at the same time. You know, that's how powerful their empire uh, was becoming. Uh, the other big conflict, of course, uh, was the Peninsular War, uh, which was this guerrilla war that broke out around 1808. Uh, when uh, apparently it became apparent that Portugal, uh, and I think also Spain later, uh, was trying to uh, trade with British, and they were they were kind of violating the continental system, uh, and so Napoleon invaded Spain mostly to get to Portugal, uh, but it caused a big war to break out uh, on the Iberian Peninsula, which became known as the so-called Peninsular War, which would last for like five six years uh, until 1814. And it was controversial because at one point, Napoleon even tried to put his brother on the throne of Spain, uh, which was uh, Joseph Joseph Bonaparte. Uh, and uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, reacted with using guerrilla warfare. Uh, and so uh, this was important later because it really hurt Napoleon's forces because he had to use a lot of his main forces uh, elsewhere, not just in Central, you know, Eastern Europe later, uh, the fight in Western Europe. And so he lost a lot of forces, you know, trying to see almost 300,000 troops were lost, killed or wounded, you know, trying to fight that that conflict. Uh, and um, the uh, Spanish and Portuguese, especially the Portuguese, uh, were backed by the British. They came in uh, to Portugal, like Lisbon, and uh, under the Duke of Wellington, Sir Arthur Wellesley, uh, they began to give them direct military aid uh, that'll kind of help to defeat, uh, you know, Napoleon later. Uh, and um, there is one thing that's very famous about the Peninsula War I did want to mention about. Uh, it did actually spark Latin American revolutions, of course, uh, in the New World. And so a lot of the colonies, the Spanish and the Portuguese, eventually would re rebel. You know, they start you know, creating their own independent states. And that's, that's another result, of course, uh, of the Peninsula War. Uh, they, of course, they've made paintings of the Peninsula War as well. There's that one you may have seen right there, uh, Los Trios Ma Mayo, Mayo uh, 1808, uh, which was done by Francisco Goya. Uh, that showed kind of some of the atrocities that the French troops created uh, where they killed by civilians and things like that. And so uh, that was one kind of bad side, of course, of a lot of these conflicts uh, of, of Napoleonic Wars, the fact that there was a lot of atrocities that were committed. But it's not as bad compared to, say, you know, World War II or something like that. Uh, of course, the big thing that caused Napoleon's downfall, as you know, uh, was his invasion of Russia, uh, which happened, of course, uh, in 1812. Uh, and, um, of course, considered one of the largest invasions, of course, in history so far uh, at this point, uh, Napoleon would eventually invade Russia uh, in the summer of 1812, I think June, June 1812 is when it is. And I do think at one point his forces may have amassed, may think at least close to half a million or more uh, into uh, Russia. And uh, the reason why Napoleon invaded Russia wasn't necessarily that he wanted to conquer it, you know, like the, say Hitler did uh, in World War II, but they believed that Russia had violated the continental system too uh, in 1812. Uh, apparently, uh, Emperor Alexander I wanted to trade with the British. I think they needed grain or something like that. And so Napoleon was invading Russia to force them back into, you know, the agreements that were with the Peace of Tilsit, where Russia was supposed to be an ally, you know, of, of, of France at that point. Uh, and um, 
uh, what happened was the Russians, uh, they responded with uh, scorched earth policies where they, they burn uh, any kind of like structures or buildings that, that could help Napoleon's forces. They burn their you know, crops and things like that. Uh, and so these were these were policies that really became a nightmare uh, for Napoleon uh, as he invaded uh, into Russia. He found that Russia was a very poor country compared to the rest of Europe. Uh, and, uh, you know, logistically, Napoleon's forces would often live off the land as they would invade a certain area. But Russia was not quite like that. Uh, and uh, I think Napoleon once remarked that an army fights on its stomach. Uh, if you know about that. Uh, and, um, you know, I think the, the most famous battle really associated with the whole uh, Russian campaign of 1812 was the Battle of Borodino, which was fought on September 7, 1812, which was probably a pivotal battle uh, for, I guess, a strategic crossroads that would then allow Napoleon to, you know, take Moscow at that point. And it was a tactical victory, but both sides, if you know about it, uh, lost a lot of troops. Uh, I think the I think the Russian side had 20 something generals that were killed or wounded uh, in the battle. And uh, it was kind of a fiery victory uh, that allowed Napoleon uh, to seize Moscow. But like I say, at a cost, of course. Uh, the only thing about Moscow uh, after he took it, uh, Alexander the first refused to surrender like in sue for peace at that point. And so it forced Napoleon to return back, Napoleon had to return back to Poland at that point uh, in the winter time, like the, the, the Russian winter uh, at that point. They think that's what cost the rest of Napoleon's forces on the way back uh, as most of his forces were either harassed uh, on their flanks uh, or the winter basically decimated uh, most of his troops and a lot of his men, like there's cases where a lot of men, like even, you know, just basically abandoned his forces uh, at that point or were captured uh, as well. Uh, there's a lot of images showing Napoleon retreating at that point. There's a lot of ones like this one you see sometimes uh, where he's on his horse and he's kind of suffering like his men is. But that's actually kind of a legend or myth uh, you're looking at there. Uh, actually, he usually would ride in a sleigh uh, and pretty much got three meals a day. So I think he was pretty much warm and cozy as most of his men were practically freezing to death. Uh, if, you study, if you study about the Russian campaign, by the way, uh, it is considered one of the bloodiest uh, conflicts uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. The, the amount of casualties uh, was close to almost 900,000 uh, were killed and wounded or captured uh, on both sides. That's combined on both sides uh, in the war which in comparison to the Eastern Front in World War II, it pales in comparison, which is true about that. Uh, I think that front, if you know about it, it was more like 20, 30 million were killed uh, on the Eastern Front uh, combined, like German and Soviet forces, uh, et cetera. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely, definitely one of the conflicts they think that caused the downfall of Napoleon. And of course, you can see here kind of a, little diagram showing you all of the Napoleon's losses uh, that he, of course, incurred uh, in the war, of course, in 1812. And you can see by the time he got back, he had very little forces left. So his forces were just wiped out uh, with, with this actual campaign. Uh, that leads into, of course, uh, the so-called, uh, they have another war breakout called the War of the Sixth Coalition in 1813 to 15. And so uh, this coalition, you have a bunch of forces that combine together, which most of them were Russia, Prussia, Austria, uh, puts up forces uh, at this point. Uh, also, Sweden put up some forces uh, as well. And uh, they would fight in northern central Europe and Germany, uh, the so-called Battle of Leipzig, uh, which was also known as the Battle of, of Nations or the Battle of the Nations is what they usually called it. It was fought between October 16th to the 19th, 1813. And uh, its nickname is called that because of the fact that all these different European powers fought. Like, I want to say like four or five countries were kind of involved uh, in the battle. Uh, and most of the European forces on the coalition side uh, were led by the Russians uh, under Alexander I. And um, 
this battle involves somewhere between 500 and 600,000 troops, which is considered one of the largest battles uh, in European history up to this point. Uh, and you have to go up to like World War I uh, before there's an even bigger battle than that, uh, which would be like the first Battle of the Marne, 1914, where they had 2 million troops uh, that would fight France, Britain versus Germany uh, to kind of give you an idea. Uh, Leipzig is very important uh, because uh, Napoleon's forces are almost practically uh, surrounded and wiped out, uh, but he's forced to retreat uh, back to France at that point. And um, it causes the collapse of the Napoleonic Empire. So the first, first French Empire uh, collapsed by about March of 1814, uh, and uh, the coalition forces eventually invade uh, into northern France by about about, yeah, March is what it is when they enter, enter the country uh, at that point. And uh, Napoleon, uh, at this point, tries to fight off, you know, the coalition forces, but his forces are just outnumbered. There's no way that he can really defeat them uh, at that point. And so Napoleon is forced to abdicate his throne uh, April 11th, uh, 1814, uh, and he's eventually sent into exile. Uh, and uh, the British and the coalition side uh, decide to send Napoleon uh, in exile to this little island off the coast of Italy uh, that was called Elba, uh, where he would be there for about, I guess, about 10 months is how long Napoleon is there. And Elba is kind of located halfway between Italy and where Corsica is. I think it's about, I want to say, 30, 40, 40 miles from Corsica is where it is. It's a very small island there. Uh, and, but they let him keep the title emperor, but the British didn't like that idea. They just wanted to call him general. Uh, they didn't think he was an emperor of anything. Uh, while all that's going on with Napoleon being exiled, uh, the European powers uh, then met at this diplomatic conference that was later known uh, as the Congress of Vienna. Uh, and it was this uh, conference where they were trying to reconstitute the political order of Europe uh, after Napoleon had practically you know, turned the apple cart over. Uh, with, with what he'd done. Uh, and so um, there's this man you see on the right. Uh, his name uh, is Clemens von Metternich. Metternich was this Austrian diplomat uh, and Austrian minister uh, that ran the conference. The conference met from about um, November 1814. It lasted to about June of 1814. So it was around for like about, I want to say, close to eight months uh, overall. And uh, this conference is very important because it creates a new system in Europe afterwards, uh, which they call it the Vienna Settlement or Vienna System. Uh, some people call it the Congress System uh, or the Congress Concert of Europe, I think is another one they also uh, called it uh, as well. And uh, later they call it the Age of Metternich uh, from this time on up to about 1848 uh, because of his influences uh, in Europe and what Metternich wanted to do uh, with Europe was he wanted to uh, create this balance of power where all the major great powers of Europe, like Britain, France, you know, Prussia, Austria, Russia, they would all be kind of equal to each other, and it would prevent these big wars from breaking out, like the Napoleonic Wars. So that was something he was trying to do uh, with these uh, diplomatic uh, reforms. And then also he wanted to restore all the monarchs in Europe that Napoleon had deposed, uh, which he'll also uh, do as well. Uh, and so uh, you can see here, it was an establishment of a conservative order. They were kind of staunchly you know, against the ideas of republicanism, uh, liberalism, uh, radicalism, uh, things like that, you know, that had you know, been push, pushed in Europe uh, by the revolution in Napoleon. Uh, they certainly were against nationalist ideas, which Napoleon was kind of pushing uh, also uh, as well. Uh, and then also Metternich helped to restore different monarchs in Europe. I'll get to it later, but uh, the Bourbons are put back in France. You know, they're put back in power, of course, in 1814 uh, with Louis XVIII, uh, the younger brother uh, of Louis XVI. Uh, and so they'll, they'll reign again uh, up to like 1830, uh, and he reigns for about 10 years, uh, Louis XVIII. Now, I'll get to that later. We'll, we'll kind of talk about what happens to, uh, you know, the Bourbons when they come back into, into France uh, at that point. 
But yeah, those are all the different goals you can see that he was trying to do uh, with the so-called Congress of Vienna. It does kind of help to create peace in Europe, at least for a while, uh, but also from British influence because of the British Empire as well. Here's kind of a map showing you too uh, what kind of Europe looks like uh, afterwards because of the Congress of Vienna. Uh, so it kind of creates a balance of power between all these different countries, which the main ones were France, Austria, Prussia, Russia, Britain. Of course, you see, of course, with that map. Uh, there was something he did develop that's famous, uh, Metternich. Uh, they had this thing called the German Confederation. I'll get more into later. Uh, but it was kind of created to replace the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which was a federation of German states uh, where it included like Austria, Prussia, Bavaria, uh, and others. Uh, that Saxony, I think, was in it uh, as well. So all these different areas, countries that were in it uh, as well. It was kind of like this replacement of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, but a lot of historians see it later as a precursor to like what would be Germany uh, in the future. Uh, but you'll see later Germany is a, is a country that's created minus Austria, of course, in it. And it did have a parliament, like a parliamentarian diet, which I think was called the uh, Federal Convention. It had a capital called Frankfurt, but it wasn't really a real country with a head of state like others, but more or less to keep peace, I guess, in that area of Germany and a replacement for the Holy Roman Empire. Now, Napoleon at this point, though, came out of exile. That's something that's true, if you know about this, in 1815. And Napoleon uh, decided uh, that he might have a chance to come back uh, and take power. And so in the spring of 1815, I think he left Elba uh, in February, this will mark a, a, another period where Napoleon returns as emperor the second time. Uh, the so-called 100 days is what historians usually call it. And uh, Napoleon realized when he got back that he would have to raise an army real fast because he had the coalition powers, had troops in Belgium, Germany. The Russians had forces more to the east uh, as well. And so Napoleon decided to go on the offensive and attack Belgium. Because uh, in Belgium, he had the British forces uh, with Prussia uh, as well that was there. There's this one general you see in that picture, of course, very famous, which was the Duke of Wellington. He, of course, was the general that would fight Napoleon in his last battle, which was called the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, and um, I think the, the Spanish had called him the English Leopard, but his troops called him the Iron Duke. Uh, and Wellington wasn't exactly the greatest offensive-minded you know, general on the battlefield. He was more of a defensive type general, uh, as you'll see. And he is considered one of the greatest British commanders that would fight, of course, uh, in, in, in the Napoleonic Wars. And um, the two would eventually fight, fight it out on June 18th, 1815 uh, at Waterloo, which was a, like a nearby village, which was in central Belgium. Uh, and um, it mostly he fought the uh, British forces of the Duke of Wellington, uh, and uh, but you also had the Prussian forces that were coming up the road uh, as well, uh, which I think Wellington had about 68,000 troops. Uh, and Blücher, uh, Gebhard von Blücher, who was a Prussian general, had about 50,000 troops uh, as well. Napoleon had about 70-something thousand troops. And uh, if Napoleon had to fight both his armies, there's no way he'd be able to fight him, and he would get easily uh, defeated. Uh, and so what Napoleon did uh, at Waterloo, here's actually the site of Waterloo now, which is like mostly a crop field uh, that you're looking at uh, in central Belgium. Napoleon decided he had to attack Wellington before Blücher came up there with his uh, forces. And so he decided a bunch to do a bunch of charges uh, in, in the middle, middle of Wellington Center with like cavalry. And then uh, later he brought up his uh, so-called Imperial Guard, and uh, they basically cracked, uh, and his whole force collapsed uh, at that point. And so Napoleon's forces were basically routed uh, in the battlefield, on the battlefield. Uh, and so what it, what it's going to end up doing, uh, four days later, Napoleon's going to have to eventually abdicate again, uh, and he goes into exile uh, after that. 
So he, I'll get to it later, but he, he gets sent to exile in the Atlantic uh, to an island called St. Helena. Uh, today at the Waterloo site, uh, there's a famous mound they built there. It's called the Lion's Mound. It was put there by the Belgians, I believe, to honor some of their soldiers that fought with Wellington there. They built this artificial mound with a lion on top of it. Uh, and uh, the, the, it's kind of controversial because it kind of messed up the field of battle, you know, that was there originally at Waterloo. Now, I think there was a story in the 1820s where Wellington went there to look at the battlefield, like where he had fought uh, back in uh, 1815. He was kind of upset by it, and he said something like, what the hell they did about battlefield <laughs> or something like that. Uh, and so he was pretty, pretty angry about it. But Waterloo was, of course, considered to be the whole turning point uh, of the Napoleonic Wars. And Napoleon was pretty much finished. And today, the word Waterloo now means a decisive defeat. Uh, of course, like I said, Napoleon was sent into exile. Uh, if you know about this, uh, he would be sent to this little island uh, in the Atlantic, Central Atlantic, off the coast of Africa called St. Helena. Uh, in Louisiana, we have a parish that's kind of named after it called St. Helena Parish, of course, today. Uh, but this actual, the name of it comes from this island that's about 1,500 miles uh, off the coast of Africa. And Napoleon would have to live there for about five and a half years. He would die in May uh, of 1821. Uh, and um, Napoleon, Napoleon uh, would actually live in this little house here you see that's called Longwood, uh, which I think was actually the converted cattle barn that they turned into a house. Uh, and uh, his rest of his life was kind of miserable, if you know about him, because he was kind of bored. Uh, he played like card games and did gardening and things like that. But uh, the thing he became famous for on St. Helena uh, was that Napoleon wrote down his memoirs about his you know, experiences uh, as a general and you know, leader of, of France. Uh, and they think that that later helped to kind of improve his image later with who he was and why Napoleon became such a great person later uh, and all that. Uh, he later died uh, in uh, Bay of 1821. Uh, uh, he was only 51 years old. Uh, Napoleon suffered from ailments at the end of his life a lot. And it's theorized that he died of stomach cancer because they think that's what killed his father uh, as well. But I know for years that they've speculated that Napoleon may have been poisoned or something like that uh, as well. Uh, but they're not sure if that's true or not. I know I think in modern times, there's been a few theories that they've studied on his hair. There's a found like arsenic, I think, in some of his hair. So some people think he may have been poisoned, but they're not sure if that's really true uh, or not. That's his death mask on the right, of course, there. Uh, and um, that's actually his original uh, burial plot, like where he was buried on the island of St. Helena. But later, uh, the French would come back later uh, and dig up his body. And as you know, uh, in the 1840s, he would be buried in Paris, France, in the Les Bleds, of course, the capital. Uh, and of course, now today, you know, Napoleon has become this, you know, national hero. Uh, of the country, of course. Uh, but, you know, Napoleon is still this, uh, he's got this legacy that's, you know, he's this great man, uh, you know, that, you know, changed Europe afterwards. You know, he's going to, of course, overturn all the things about Europe, uh, its legacy before. But Napoleon's still kind of a controversial figure uh, overall. Uh, he's not a Hitler. That's one thing about Napoleon uh, that's definitely not true about him. I know he did kill a lot of people in his conflicts, but I think now, People tend to have more positive images of Napoleon now uh, more than anything uh, compared to, say, Hitler uh, overall. That's it pretty much on the age of Napoleon. Uh, of course, later in the week, I'll kind of be moving on to talk about 19th century Europe. I'll kind of get into the post-Napoleon Europe uh, as well. Kind of, I'll kind of talk about some things that happened after Napoleon is deposed pretty much.